Okay, I think we'll get started. So, um, I'm very happy to introduce um, Amanda Prorock to you. So, Amanda um, did her PhD in Switzerland at EPFL, <coughs> working on um, multi robot localization using ultra wideband techniques, and then she Moved, came to this side of the Atlantic, uh, and, and she's right now in, in the grass lab working with uh, Vijay Kumar um, on a number of sort of multi-robot things, uh, as you all know from the, the impressive stuff that, uh, that Vijay does. Um, so Amanda is, uh, is interviewing CSE today, but she's very accustomed to UCSD by now. She interviewed <laughs> in COXI last week and in EC yesterday, so... She's getting sort of the full exposure to the, the things that we're doing here. And then she's going to talk about the resilience and the diversity in, in robot networks. And I promise you, you're in for a real treat. Please. Henrik, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for the kind introduction. And it's a, a real pleasure uh, for me to be here today. So my story starts with a global perspective on how we're living today. And it's a well-known fact that today... Uh, over 50% of the world's population actually lives in cities. And this value is expected to increase to 70% by 2050. So this development will stress our critical infrastructure, it'll stress our city health, and as a consequence, it'll also stress us. In particular, because it will be affecting our transportation systems, it'll be affecting the quality of our urban spaces, the way we distribute our resources, and also our telecommunications networks. But luckily, technology is really being driven by a number of factors. We're seeing the falling costs of communications and storage devices. We're seeing the falling costs of batteries. We can now store more energy for less weight. Uh, we're also seeing the falling costs of sensors, largely due to mass production. And finally, we're also able to much more rapidly ideate and test new ideas thanks to new production methods. So these developments are leading to a profusion of new types of robots and autonomous devices. So for example, um, the new production methods are allowing us to build self-foldable, self-actuated robots. Uh, we're also seeing how cheap off-the-shelf components are allowing us to build swarms of robots such as the Perdix. Uh, we're also seeing uh, the commoditization of sophisticated sensors, enabling uh, the testing and production of autonomous vehicles. And finally, we're also seeing the introduction of robots into our homes. And these are not just robots that uh, are toys, but we can actually even program these robots. So uh, these developments are great, but where are we heading? So I would argue that we're heading towards a reality where robotics is pervasive, it's connected, and it's heterogeneous. So I'm talking about robots uh, that are helping us to distribute and share resources, I'm talking about robots that play a role in automating transport. And I'm also talking about robots that are part of enhancing our surroundings, such as in the Internet of Things. And so these solutions will really help us to respond to the challenges of urbanization and dense living. So I also have a more personal motivation behind uh, studying heterogeneous network robotic systems. So in my PhD, uh, I was solving the problem of indoor localization in robot teams that were using both ultra-wideband and relative infrared-based uh, positioning. And so I realized at the time that there's actually much more that we can do beyond just considering heterogeneous and complementary sensing capabilities. But at the time, there was no theory that would help me to understand this trade space between complementarity, redundancy, and robustness. And so at the end of my PhD, I decided that I would take a step back and really think about how heterogeneous robotic systems can help us to solve complex problems. And so to go beyond the current status quo and to really exploit the diversity of such heterogeneous network robotic systems, we need to understand how these systems are optimal, not only at the individual platform level, but as a whole at a systems level. And so to do this, we're creating networks. We're creating communications, interaction, or collaboration networks. And we're endowing these robots with algorithms that allow them to leverage uh, and collaborate and leverage the technical complementarities that they have. 
So there is actually a list of challenges that we need to, uh, to address and that are unique uh, to such systems. And so um, the, the challenges in particular, and I'm going to be talking about two of these challenges today, are firstly, uh, how do we, or what kind of robots do we need to work together? Or in other words, how do we tune the diversity of such heterogeneous multi-robot systems so that we're somehow optimizing the performance of these systems as a whole? As a whole? And the second challenge is uh, resilience. And so resilience is actually important when we're considering heterogeneous teams of robots where these different robot types, they depend on each other. And these dependencies, they really lead to new failure modes. And so the question here is, what mechanisms do we need to put in place that prevent and deal with these kinds of failures? And so first I'm going to talk a little bit about composition. So um, let's consider this heterogeneous uh, robot network where the robots are working together to solve a problem. For example, here they're trying to secure a space or monitor a geographical area. And they're exploiting the fact that they have complementary uh, capabilities. For example, the, the sturdier, uh, heavier ground robots can actually carry more powerful communications uh, modules, whereas the aerial robots here can provide an alternate point of view onto the scenario of interest. And so um, one way of actually generalizing this problem formulation is to divide this problem into subtasks. And each subtask here is going to be serviced by robot coalitions. So we can either build very specialized robots that can accomplish a very specific task, or we can make generic robots that solve at least part of a wider variety of tasks. And so the key here is that these two systems, they differ in their degree of diversity. And so what I would like to find out is what is the impact of diversity on performance? Is there an optimal composition? And how do we even go about controlling and guiding such large-scale heterogeneous systems? So we can actually abstract this problem to the context of task allocation, where we have coalitions, where these coalitions are, or robot coalitions, are solving individual tasks, and individual robots in these coalitions can switch between these individual tasks in these problems. And so each uh, robot type here in the system has an average uh, switching frequency. And so, for example, here we could be considering that these robot coalitions are together working to survey a geographically distributed space. Um, and as we consider the topology of this workspace as a graph, we can, for example, define edges on the directions of these, uh, we can define directions on the edges of these graphs that tell the robots how they can actually transition from one task to another uh, in this connected workspace. And so we can even uh, more broadly view this pro problem uh, formulation as a collection of tasks uh, by considering that these are nodes in a connected graph and the robot types can switch from uh, one task to another at a given rate. Now, assuming that we can somehow quantify the robot capabilities, we can then represent the amount of acquired capabilities at any one of the tasks in the system. And so the problem now is, given that I have an initial distribution of robots and a target distribution of capabilities over the tasks in the system, can I somehow map heterogeneous robots to tasks with diverse needs? And second, can I then synthesize the control policies that will satisfy these task assignments? So this problem is actually hard due to its combinatorial uh, formulation and due to the scale of the problem, uh, given that we are considering uh, large-scale uh, heterogeneous robot systems. So formally assigning heterogeneous robots to uh, tasks that have heterogeneous requirements is an instance of the set cover problem. And this is a problem that is NP-hard to solve. So if we consider this problem in the discrete domain, um, heuristic uh, approaches have been proposed, such as that by Schwartel in 79, uh, and they were later formulated for the multi-agent uh, domain by Shahori and uh, Diaz. But the downside of these methods is that they depend on the number of robots in the system, or the complexity depends on the no number of robots in these systems. So as we relax this problem formulation to the continuous domain, we actually find more scalable uh, solutions. Uh, such as those propo proposed by Berman and Sheem.
But these uh, solutions actually only applied to homogeneous robot teams. And so what we need is we need methods that solve the heterogeneous assignment problem and that also scale with the number of robots, the number of robot types, and the number of robot uh, capabilities. And so I'm actually going to be choosing a continuous approach to solve this problem that will allow me to find a solution that scales with the number of robots in my system at the cost of being less precise at the individual robot level than a dis discrete approach uh, would be. But the main point here, and irrespective of me choosing a continuous or discrete approach, is that there has been little to no work at all uh, done to in quantifying the functional diversity uh, on the performance of these systems. And this is actually going to be the main goal of the framework that I'm going to be showing to you in the next uh, few minutes. So the key ideas of my work are threefold. Um, the first idea here is that I take a mean field approach to modeling the distribution dynamics of my robot team with an ordinary differential equation, where I have x dot here, which is modeling the change in the dis distribution of a robot type S over the tasks in my system, being equal to my transition rate matrix multiplied by x, which is the current distribution of robots over the tasks in my system. So in other words, I'm actually modeling the evolution of my robot team as a continuous time Markov chain. Or, uh, and second, the thing that I'm doing is I'm representing the diversity of my robot team through a binary species traits matrix. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying that a species is a robot type and a trait is a robot capability. So if I have a binary capability, for example, a robot has or doesn't have a sensor, I can very easily represent this in uh, this binary matrix. If I have a continuous capability, such as uh, a sensing range, I would have to consider a way of quantizing this continuous capability and representing it through one-hot encodings in this binary matrix. And the third part of my approach is that I'm now using this species trait matrix and I'm multiplying it by X, which is the distribution of my robot team over the tasks in my system to map uh, or to be able to map the, the, the distribution of capabilities over the task space um, of my problem definition. So now the problem is how do I even go about controlling a homogeneous uh, robot team? So the first thing that I need to do is to find a solution to this ordinary differential equation. And I do this by taking the matrix exponential um, K of my transition rate matrix K, multiplying this by the initial distribution of my robots X0, which gives me the distribution of my robot team at any time T. Now the problem formulation turns out to be, given that I have a desired robot distribution X star, can I now find the transition rates K star that are fastest to satisfy this optimal uh, robot distribution. So state of the art has considered two different approaches to this. Um, first, if we approximate my transition rate matrix K, uh, we can formulate a convex optimization problem uh, and solve this with semi-definite uh, programming methods. Or uh, the other method uh, considers stochastic optimization approaches. So now, um, in the case of heterogeneous robot teams, the problem formulation is actually different. And I'd like to recall that we're actually mapping the robot distribution into the space of capabilities versus tasks by multiplying it by, with Q, which is my species trait matrix. And so the current problem formulation actually is, given that I have a desired trait distribution, Y star, uh, can I find the transition rates K star that are fastest to satisfy this distribution of capabilities. And so uh, here the solution to my system would be to model the evolution of traits as a function of time, and I do this by taking the matrix exponential of my transition rate matrix K, multiplying this by the initial distribution of my robots over the tasks, and multiplying that by Q, which is the capabilities that each of these robot species own. And then I sum this up for all the species in my system. So the problem here, the challenge, is that we no longer have a one-to-one -one mapping between the robots and their capabilities. And hence, we don't have uh, knowledge of what the desired robot distribution, X star, should look like. And because of that, we cannot apply the methods that were developed for homogeneous robot teams. And so here, I'm going to solve the problem by setting up an optimization problem where I'm going to try to minimize the convergence time of my robot team to this desired distribution of capabilities. 
And so I'm going to set up a first constraint that will account for the error to the desired trait distribution. And I do this by taking uh, the difference between y star and my current distribution of traits. And then, uh, actually, I have to consider that only considering this first constraint, I will not have a guarantee that this robot distribution will actually be at a steady state uh, when it reaches this target. And so I can then optionally set, uh, set up a second constraint, which will um, account for how much the solution actually deviates from the uh, system steady state. And I, this is given by taking the uh, current distribution of my robot team, which is um, the matrix exponential k times x0 at time tau, and I subtract that uh, from the robot distribution at a time tau plus nu. And so um, now I'm going to overall be minimizing my convergence time tau with respect to these two constraints, and I will also be bounding the maximum uh, transitioning frequency that any robot type in my system uh, can exert. And so the reason that I actually choose this optimization method is that I can actually find an analytical gradient uh, to the constraints of this problem. And I do this by building on a previous result that was proposed by Karl Pleisch in 85 that specifies an analytical solution to the derivative of uh, the matrix exponential. And this is needed uh, for the constraints in my system. And so the nice thing is that for one optimization step, the complexity is given by this formula, which uh, where the first term is actually corresponding to the eigen decomposition of my transition rate matrix, and the second term corresponds to the matrix multiplications. And you can see now that this uh, complexity here is linear in the number of species and traits and polynomial in the number of tasks. And the nice thing is, is that it does not depend on the number of robots that we have in our system. So overall, we have this optimal control policy, which is given by our optimal transition rate matrix uh, K star. And so when I deploy my system, I can either consider that I have a probabilistic robot controller that can be directly derived from these transitioning rates that are given by K star, or if I consider that I have a deterministic uh, robot controller, what I would need to do is to tune the parameters of these deterministic controllers such that they match uh, the rates that are given by uh, my matrix uh, K star. So because this is all um, a bit abstract, uh, I'm going to show you a little movie that kind of demonstrates what the system actually looks like when it's performing. So here you could imagine, so this looks um, a, a little bit uh, abstract, but you could imagine that this is um, representing the distribution of, uh, of resources or that I'm responding to uh, dynamic requests in the system. So what you can see here is before I play the movie, I have a swarm of robots in the middle of this uh, movie here, and I have six tasks which are represented by these white disks. And um, the robots are color encoded, and you can see the capabilities that these different robot species own by looking at that little matrix in the upper right-hand side corner of, uh, of this panel. And so what I want to do here is I want these robots to redistribute uh, after they uh, get into their initial distributions so that they fill up these white wireframes, where these white wireframes are representing how much of a certain capability I need at any one of these tasks in the system. So as a robot moves underneath one of these task spaces, it is actually carrying in the capabilities that it owns, which is given by that matrix. So as I play this movie, you now see this is the initial distribution of robots, that's the initial distribution of capabilities, and I'm now applying this optimal control policy, and the robots will redistribute such that at the steady state of the system, we're actually going to be satisfying these uh, trait uh, demands uh, as given by these white wireframes. And so now we converge, and uh, the system is, uh, is satisfying my initial uh, requirements. And so now I actually have a way of measuring the performance of my system by, by looking at how long it takes for the system to converge. Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt, yes. but I'm just trying yes. to understand yeah. the, the graphics here. Mm -hmm. The three disks that you have are out there. Mm -hmm. That's where the initially robots right. are uh, right. distributed. Exactly. So. We, we have a task space here where we actually have six tasks altogether, but the three disks on the right-hand side happen to be where the robots were initially located. So they're not doing anything, but they're just made available in those three parking spaces or something? For example, yeah, if you consider that this is actually a geographic problem, then they could have been solving tasks there in a previous epoch, but these white wireframes correspond to what we want in the next epoch, for example. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So now I want to go back to the original question that I posed. There's another question. Yeah. 
Go ahead. Should I be worried that the wireframes aren't completely filled? Well, um, I actually stopped the movie before I was fully at steady state. And because we're taking a mean field approach here, we're actually only guaranteeing it on average. So there will always be fluctuations around these white wireframes. Yeah. It's actually stochastic in that sense. Mm -hmm. So I'm now going to go back to the original uh, question that I posed, which is how does diversity relate to performance? And so it turns out that we can actually mathematically show that the diversity is represented by the rank of my species traits matrix. And so in the case of a full rank system, which is that what I have on the left hand side, um, I have that the rank of my matrix Q is equal to the number of species um, in my system. And I'm saying that all the species here are independent, and I'm calling them eigenspecies. If I have a rank deficient system, so the rank of Q is smaller than the number of species S, I actually have that there's at least one species in my system that can be represented as a linear combination of two or more other species in my system. And so here I have that the eigenspecies cardinality is smaller than the number of species in my system. And so ultimately what this formulation does, it actually helps us reason about the diversity of engineered systems. Or more specifically, in my scenario, we can actually correlate the performance as given by the convergence time of my system with its uh, diversity. And the insight that this work is actually putting forward is that the more diverse and complementary the system is, the harder it is, actually, it is actually to optimize. And it may actually be beneficial to include redundancy in our robotic teams, hereby defining a unique trade-off between cost, as given by redundancy, and performance. So considering this insight, we may actually want to deploy fewer robot types, but which own more redundant uh, capabilities and carry more of the necessary capabilities. But not only is this expensive, but also this may simply not be possible because we have to consider that our platforms are constrained at the individual robot level, and we're actually forced to distribute capabilities amongst different robotic platforms. And so what this means is that some complementarity is actually unavoidable when we are building robotic platforms. And so this raises the question, what actually happens when we have one robot type in these systems that fails? And so how can we, how can we actually prevent these types of failures from affecting the performance of the rest of the system? And this really leads to the second topic of my talk, which is resilience. So can we develop mechanisms that prevent and deal uh, with failures? Or in other words, can we provide resilience in the face of faulty or non-cooperative robots? So there are actually three aspects to resilience that we need to consider. Uh, the first aspect is resilience at a platform level, where I'm considering local or environmental threats. And a lot of the work here that I'm um, citing is actually work that I did in my thesis. Um, and I won't actually be talking much about this today due to um, uh, time constraints. The second aspect is resilience at the team level where we're really considering these internal uh, failure modes. And the third aspect here is resilience at a systems level, where we may want to consider external threats. And I will say a few things about that in, in, in future work. But now I want to talk a little bit more about resilience at a team level. So one way that we coordinate teams is through an algorithm that is called consensus. And the utility of consensus is really that it allows us to achieve agreement on a global variable of interest purely through local interaction. So uh, you, uh, the consensus algorithm has actually found a lot of traction in multi-robot systems research because it allows us to do things such as motion coordination, uh, cooperative estimation, or clock synchronization. And so the way it works is that every robot will locally average its value with the values of its neighboring robots. And so the outcome of the consensus algorithm is that all robots will exponentially converge to uh, the same value, and this value is, the, is a weighted average of the initial conditions. But um, the assumption that the consensus protocol makes is that all the robots in these teams are effectively cooperative, and they're all ex um, executing this protocol exactly as it's prescribed. And so what happens when we have non-cooperative robots? And what I mean by a non-cooperative robot is a robot that is either faulty or malicious. Or more formally, this is a robot that might sometimes send the prescribed value xi, but sometimes may send an arbitrary value xi prime. Or the robot may always send an arbitrary value xi prime. 
And so in these cases, what will happen is that our system will either never converge or it might converge, but it'll converge outside the range of our initial conditions. So let me just show you an example of a non-resilient system. So what we have here is a team of 12 robots, um, and what they aim to do is they aim to converge on the same direction of motion in which they're going to be heading. And what we expect the system to do is to converge to the average condition of all the cooperative robots in this system, which is a direction pointing to the upper left-hand side um, corner of this panel. We have one non-cooperative robot in the system, which is going to be communicating a value pointing into the upper right-hand side corner of this panel. And so because this is a non-resilient system, what will actually happen is that all the robots will be affected by this non-cooperative robot, and they will end up going in the direction that is dictated by this non-cooperative robot. And so this is something that we would like to be able to avoid. And so how do we do this? So our goal here is to provide mechanisms that are able to handle uh, a number of F anonymous non-cooperative robots. So there has been uh, quite some work in this domain. Um, uh, early work and seminal work by Francesca Bullo and colleagues state that if we have a 2F plus 1 vertex connected network, then we can develop algorithms that allow us to detect up to F non-cooperative uh, nodes in these systems. So the downside of this method is that it relies on, or the algorithms, they rely on non-local information in order to be able to detect these non-cooperative agents. And it has only been applied to static graphs. Uh, more recently, Sundaram and colleagues have proposed this notion of an R-robust network topology where the strong point of this network topology is that the algorithms that allow us to deal with these F non-cooperative agents only rely on local information. So the downside here is that these methods were only applied to static communication topologies, to static graphs. They do not consider any physical embeddings, which means that any node can essentially be connected to any other node in the network. And testing for our robustness is NP-hard. So uh, this summer, we have um, actually worked on this, um, and we proposed this notion of triangular networks, which is very nice because we can actually provide robustness when we have constrained communication ranges. And we can actually validate these topologies in polynomial time. But the downside of our method was that we only considered a very specific case, which is f equals 1, so only for one non-cooperative agent, and we only applied it to static graphs. So what we still need is we need methods that deal with dynamic networks, we need methods that deal with constrained communication ranges, and we need methods that are able to operate with only local information. And so we're going to build on this notion of robust graphs um, in order to be able to do this. And I'm going to tell you how we actually do this. So our approach is building on this notion of our robust topologies that was proposed by Sundram in uh, 2012. And our robustness relies on this notion of our reachability, where our reachability says that a set is our reachable if it's reachable by at least our vertices that are outside of its set. And so then we say that the graph is R robust if for every pair of subsets in that graph, at least one of the subsets is R reachable. So if we look at the center panel here and I remove the edge that is uh, going down the center, I can find these two sets where neither of them is reachable by three vertices outside of, it, outside of its set. If I add that edge back, we can see that the bottom um, set here is reachable by three vertices outside of its set. And then I do this for every two possible subsets of this graph, and I can show that this graph is three robust. And so the main result that Sundram proposes is that if I have a 2F plus 1 robust network with up to F non-cooperative agents, then uh, all, uh, and all these cooperative agents are updating with a slightly modified consensus protocol called WMSR, then this network will converge to a value that lies within the range of initial conditions of all the cooperative agents in our system. And so let me just really briefly tell you what this WMSR algorithm actually does. So WMSR stands for Weighted Mean Subsequence Reduced Algorithm. And what, it, what uh, every agent will do here is it will essentially filter the incoming values. It'll remove the F largest and the F smallest values. And then on the remaining values in this list, it'll perform um, the consensus uh, update. So uh, given that uh, we're doing this, uh, in order to guarantee that we will actually be resilient, in order to apply this WMSR algorithm, we need to know that, every, uh, that we are in an r bus topology at any point in time when we're actually applying this algorithm. And so this leads to the challenges that are, how do we efficiently test for our robustness? And how do we maintain this required connectivity dynamically? So um, 
In order to get around this first question, we decided that we would actually synthesize our uh, robust formations from scratch instead of testing for our robustness. And so in order to do this, we actually introduced this concept of an F-elemental graph, which is a graph that is composed of the minimum number of nodes necessary to support F non-cooperative robots. And so we also proposed an algorithm that uh, can build these F-elemental structures. So based on these F-elemental structures, we can also build larger R-robust topologies. And we do this by uh, defining auxiliary F-elemental uh, structures that tell us how the edges to these additional robots have to be uh, connected such that these additional robots are connected to the original formations, and these original formations are then augmented and still uh, are robust. And so the nice thing is that these construction algorithms, they run in polynomial time. So now we actually have to consider that robot networks undergo motion. And motion creates time-varying topologies. And so the question is, how do we maintain required connectivity dynamically? And this question is difficult since testing for our robustness is NP-hard, and this is further compounded by the dynamics of these uh, communications networks. And so our idea here was, can we find a lower bound on our robustness that is easier to compute? So the first thing that we found is that the value R is actually lower bounded by the isomeric, isoparametric constant of the graph, where the isoparametric constant is the minimum of the average number of edges that is connecting any two um, subsets in the graph. But the problem here is that the isoparametric constant is also NP-hard to compute. And so what we found is we found a second lower bound, which says that the algebraic connectivity, uh, we found that the uh, isoparametric constant is, is lower bounded by half the algebraic connectivity of the graph. And this led to what we're calling the resilience threshold, which says that the algebraic connectivity has to be at least four times the number of non-cooperative uh, agents in our system in order to ensure that we have a robust uh, topology. And the nice thing about this here is actually that the algebraic connectivity is easy to compute. So the key here is now that we're going to use this algebraic connectivity to control the connectivity of our dynamic uh, robot networks, and we're going to ensure our robustness throughout time such that we can achieve resilient consensus uh, on these variable of uh, interests. And I'm going to show you how we do this on the same example that I showed you before, uh, where the robots are trying to find the agreement on the direction of heading. So again, we have this one non-cooperative robot, and what you're going to see here now is that the robots are going to be using this connectivity control jointly with the resilience threshold, and the team will only be running the consensus dynamics when they know that they're actually in a resilient network topology. And so I play this movie, the robots are uh, achieving the required uh, network connectivity, they're applying the consensus protocol, and now they're successfully ignoring this uh, value that is communicated by the non-cooperative robot, and they're moving into the direction which corresponds to the average of the initial conditions of all the cooperative robots in our system. So now I'd actually round off my talk by spending a few more minutes to talk a little bit about some ideas that I've been having on how to provide resilience at a systems level. And uh, 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 with respect to external threats that we can be uh, that can occur in such systems, and so one thing that I've been particularly interested in is how do we protect our systems from internal failures when they actually happen to external events? Because I I would argue that even if we're securing the communications channels in these networks, other observations of the behavior of our systems may actually reveal sensitive information about the critical components of our systems. And I've been particularly interested in, uh, or the way I'm actually thinking about doing this, is by providing methods that allow us to conceal the different roles and functionalities and responsibilities of the various robots in our systems. And so I'm arguing that actually doing this is a question of privacy. And so the first thing that I want to do here is develop a metric that quantifies how private our systems are as a function of their collaboration dynamics. So my goal here is really to hide the individual roles and robot types in interdependent collaborative robot networks. So the origin of privacy research actually stems from the database literature where uh, early measures of privacy defined privacy as a function of the amount of added noise to the systems or as uh, the difference between a priori and a posteriori uh, beliefs. 
But the issue or the downside of these methods is that they consider that all the entities that we're essentially trying to protect are independent and they're static. So more recently, um, collaborators from George Papa's group have taken a systems theoretic approach to privacy, where the entities that we're trying to protect here are, can now actually be time varying signals. But the downside of this method is that these entities are still independent. So what I want to do is I want to be able to quantify the system-wide privacy of collaborative robot networks where the entities we're trying to protect are dependent on each other, which will ultimately allow me to optimize such things as design parameters, um, control and composition, such that I can maintain a certain privacy level while also maintaining a minimum level of performance in my robotic systems. So because these ideas are a bit abstract, I want to illustrate this with a very simple uh, scenario. So here in the scenario, uh, what we have is we have a team of ground robots where the ground robots have two different types and we have quad rotors. And uh, these robots are, are, are going about a task and working together. And uh, as I let the system run, we can observe the states that the robots are in. And for here, for example, we can observe that we have two robots um, which are single and one ground robot that is currently collaborating with the quad rotor. So now we're going to assume that an adversary can also observe the system. To this adversary, however, all the ground robots, they look the same. Now, the adversary is making an observation, and this observation is a design variable. And what he's observing is that he can see that there are two robots that are single and one robot that is collaborating with the quad rotor. Now, the adversary actually wants um, to infer the type of this ground robot here on the left. And we're actually going to assume the worst case scenario, which is the adversary knows the types of all the other robots in the system. So the question that I'm now going to pose is, how easy is it for the adversary to infer the type of this robot here, given that he may have uh, any worst case scenario on side information? So one measure that has gained a lot of traction recently is a measure that is uh, given by differential privacy and that was proposed by Cynthia Dwork in 2006. And so this measure of leakage is actually very interesting because it abstracts or it models um, arbitrary side information where side information is essentially prior information on the entities that we want to protect in our system. And so this leakage formula uh, depends on two main concepts. It depends on the notion of a database which is essentially a database of the entities that we want to protect. And it depends on this notion of a query, which is essentially a measurement that is performed on this database and that releases information to the public. And so what this uh, uh, measure actually captures is by how much these uh, distributions over the query change as we change one single element in the database. And so what we need to do now in order to apply this to our case of interest is to define analogies for the notions of a database and a query. And so the way I'm thinking about doing this is by saying that the database is representing the composition of my system, where, or essentially how many robots of which types are in my system, and where the query is actually an observation of my robot system. For example, it could be a discrete probability distribution over all possible uh, system states. And so the leakage will now tell us by how much the distribution of the observable state changes as one robot type in my system changes. And so when uh, finally I can actually say that my robot network is going to be epsilon indistinguishable when this leakage value is smaller than a certain value epsilon. So um, for example, in my case here, um, I, I can instantiate two adjacent databases where I'm actually varying a single robot type in these databases. So robot uh, of ID2 is once of type uh, green and once of type uh, red. And um, I can then, uh, to compute the query, assume that I, I can somehow model the dynamics of this interdependent robot system by deriving the, the distribution over all possible observable states of my system. And the key here is that the likelihood of observing a system that stems from my database one is going to be different than the likelihood of observing a system that stems uh, from database two. And so if I go back to my example and we occur, um, recall that the adversary is making this observation given by my vector two one, we can see that um, the likelihood of observing a system that stems from database two is higher. And hence the adversary can infer that the more likely robot type for that robot there on the left is going to be type red. And so this really need, now leads to the concept of privacy that I want to communicate today, which is 
Um, can I develop a metric that quantifies how easy it is for the adversary to guess the type of any robot in my system given arbitrary side information? And so if the disparity of the observable distributions is low enough, then the adversary can actually not that confidently validate or reject any of his uh, assumptions. And so formally, this actually um, boils down to saying, how does a single change in my database affect the observable state of my system? So we've applied this uh, methodology to dynamic collaboration networks that can be represented by trees, and we made two main observations. So on the one hand side, as our networks grow more asymmetric, um, the collaboration load between the different robot types becomes less balanced, and we're actually incurring a loss of privacy. And second, as we require larger coalitions of more and different robot types, we're also incurring a loss of privacy. And so by following these two rules, we can actually create collaboration networks that are more resilient to external threats because they're becoming more, it's becoming more opaque towards the outside what is actually going on inside of our systems and what the individual robot types are actually doing. So the message of my talk is really uh, that heterogeneous robot networks present us with ample opportunities, but we need to be mindful of how we compose them and how we operate them. So I've, I've shown you how we can think of developing diversity metrics um, and uh, how we can think of de developing optimal control policies for distributing heterogeneous systems. And the insight that this has put forward is that the more diverse our systems are, the harder it may actually be to optimize them. And there is a benefit of including redundancy in our systems. And this is really leading to a unique trade-off between cost, given by the redundancy, and uh, performance. And on resilience, I've talked about um, how to build resilient formations and providing resilient control strategies, and also a little bit about privacy. And so the insight here is that we can actually provide resilience to non-cooperative communication, and we can do this for dynamic networks with constrained communication ranges. Privacy is a promising direction uh, for shielding um, our systems uh, from external threats as well. And so looking forwards, um, I think that we need to think about how systems actually will become highly heterogeneous in the future. And we need to think of much more powerful ways of actually modeling um, heterogeneity and diversity beyond what I've shown you today. For example, we need to be thinking about how to model uncertainties and what robots can actually do, and actually the dependencies between these different capabilities. And the applications here are numerous, for example, customizing teams for situational awareness and also long-term autonomy. We also need to think about how robots are going to be part of safety critical applications and why resilience is actually a very important topic that should be an organic element of the algorithms that we're developing. And here we need to think about ways of further relaxing these assumptions that we're making on how to be able to create these robust network topologies that provide us with the resilience that we actually need. And so applications here are, for example, platooning on highways or more largely uh, any multi-robot deployments, um, such as for coverage or monitoring purposes. And finally, looking even farther ahead, I think the way that we view heterogeneous robot systems needs not only to include different robot types, but also humans. And in particular, as we include humans into these systems, we need to think about how we might uh, be uh, protecting our humans and in ensuring their integrity as they interact with these robot networks. And so here, we need to think of how to guarantee the privacy and how we might be controlling our robot networks under these privacy constraints. And so I really want to conclude by bringing this all back into a, a global perspective. And we need to keep in mind that the number of connections between robots, cyber-physical systems, uh, and machines will actually triple in the next four years. And this will impact a very wide range of, of sectors. So finally, um, I'd like to uh, conclude by thanking my collaborators at Penn, Vijay Kumar, George Papas, and Ani Shi, at Purdue, um, Shreya Sundaram, and my thesis advisor, Alkiria Martinoli at EPFL. I'd like to thank the students who have worked with me on uh, some of the experimental work and also on the resilience work, uh, David, Kelsey, Lewis, uh, Mickey, and Monroe. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my funding that has supported the work that I've presented to you today. And I'd be happy to take any additional questions now. Thanks. Questions for Amanda? Awesome. So you had uh, one example where you had a malicious robot in the center mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it kept on reporting an incorrect you know, vector. Mm -hmm. And then the, the rest were 
the rest of the swarm is able to reach a consensus mm -hmm. that disagreed, but the the misbehaving agent still complies. Mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. what, yes, what, yes, what yes. What do you do in scenarios yes. where it's, it's yeah. still, you know, uh, Immovable. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so our assumption is that the maliciousness here or the non-cooperative element is in the communication alone. The motion in that example was actually cooperative. Uh, and the reason that we're doing this is because we consider the problem of malicious or non-cooperative communication to be much more tricky. Because if you have non-cooperative motion, there are other methods that allow you to easily detect and, and actually eject these elements from your system. And there has actually been uh, work, uh, there's some work by Magnus Eggerset, for example, how you can actually probe a system that is actually in its motion dynamics not cooperating. You can check if these, if all the nodes in your system are actually uh, behaving as, as they should. So these are actually two complementary research questions, and here we're really only considering the comms aspect. Mm -hmm. So, um how does your system deal with, uh, suppose, um, you know, something that seems like a cooperative agent then gets hacked and becomes non-cooperative, mm -hmm. uh, how does the system respond? So when you have a switch between, um, okay, so um, I think one of the, the interesting points of um, the the method or the these topologies that I'm showing you here is that well first they assume that um, the anonymous uh, that the non-cooperative nodes are anonymous so we don't know how we don't know who they are at any point in time and the second thing is I don't know if this is a strength or a weakness is that f is actually an upper bound so if we have a realistic assumption of what our upper bound is. Uh, whatever we do is going to work for that upper bound. If we actually exceed that upper bound, it won't work anymore. So we have to think carefully about how we're actually going to calibrate that value f. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for, these, for these systems, uh, each, each robot has a uh, contribution into uh, arriving to a consensus. Mm -hmm. What if that, that weight they have is not uniform? Um, so like maybe a tank is a little slightly more weighted to the oh. overall mm -hmm. trajectory of the swarm than necessarily these quadrators. So you are giving different different importance to different robots in your systems. Um, well, we haven't formally analyzed that, um, but there is, for example, some work uh, by Xenophon Kutsukos at Vanderbilt um, who models these kind of robustness questions in the cases where you actually have trusted nodes in your network. So you might want to think about how can you, if you want to give a higher weight to certain nodes in your systems, can you actually say something about how much you're actually going to trust those nodes that have higher weights? So maybe that would be one interesting um, way of considering the problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I have looked at some of your papers mm -hmm. and uh, beautiful formulations and uh, you uh, show that uh, a lot of these things uh, uh, behave uh, according to your optimization criteria and mm -hmm. all that mm -hmm. set up. Mm -hmm. Now if you just imagine for mm -hmm. a while mm -hmm. that uh, for the next couple of years mm -hmm. uh, you are going to look at any real-world problem where you can illustrate the essential contributions that you have made, mm -hmm. but not on a paper, but mm -hmm. on a real-world application, what would that be and how would we see it? So you're looking for an actual instantiation of some of the research. Right. In many right. of your conclusions, you right. say that next step would be Mm -hmm. This need to work with real-time applications right, and constraints right. and all that. So I what is that particular one that you can think of as the first one? Not, you don't have to solve all of them. Ah, you want to nail me down to one single application. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, well, uh, maybe because it's very... Um, it's an extension of what I showed you there, uh, and also because this is uh, maybe this video here, this is actually some work that we've started doing at Penn. Um, I think the question of uh, um, constrained workspaces uh, is very interesting in combination with constrained uh, motion dynamics. So here we're actually seeing a case of two uh, platoons that are, uh, I didn't actually explain the mechanics of what we're doing here, but they're actually overtaking, it's an overtaking scenario. And these two platoons are actually cooperating so that the fast platoon coming from the back is going to be able to overtake this lower uh, platoon in the front that is um, taking up both lanes, right? So I think this is an interesting problem if we're thinking about really optimizing throughput of, of highways. So, so for example, 
this could be one interesting application and then an extension to the resilience uh, platform or a framework that I showed you before, which is essentially holonomic right now and it's in, in, its, uh, in, in its form and implementation. So understanding how to do that kind of thing on a highway with constrained motion and constrained workspace is very difficult, which I think might be an interesting way to go. So just to push a little bit more on that, uh, uh, highways are significantly different than this particular scenario. Yeah. And uh, what happens there mm -hmm. is very difficult mm -hmm. to even uh, uh, the uncertainties, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. real world problems mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. are significantly different mm -hmm. than this. Mm -hmm. But it was my thought that maybe warehouses mm -hmm. might mm -hmm. be a little closer mm -hmm. to this. Mm -hmm. And again, I haven't mm -hmm. worked on it, but mm -hmm. would you think that? And if that is true, then are there things that you are aware of on these giant warehouses? where some of these kinds of things can really be Intimate. Definitely. Um, so the thing in warehouses, um, well, actually, warehouses are an interesting scenario because you get this very interesting trade-off between centralization and decentralization. So warehouses being a very structured environment, you can exploit the centralized component much more than than maybe in other more unstructured environments. Um, and I know, I mean, there's Amazon Robotics, um, but those systems are currently fully centralized. So um, I think there the research challenge is to find out how can we make them even more resilient or even more efficient by introducing some of these methods and maybe decentralizing some of the algorithmic components? So that could definitely be an interesting um, uh, component. And I have actually been talking to some people from Amazon Robotics who are trying to, to do these kinds of things. But it's, it's a very hard problem because um, they don't have a lot of slack in their, in their processes. Uh, and so trying to find out how to really provide uh, benefit or improvement is, is difficult. Yeah. But uh, a great research question and challenge. Thank you. So, if I look at your sort of your composition and, and your your privacy, an obvious question mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. how much information do you need to give away to mm -hmm. participate mm -hmm. in your teams? Mm -hmm. In some sense, today you yeah. are making the assumption yep, I know yep, yep. everything about my partners, right, right. and that's almost never true. Yeah. So, so what that's an amazing question. Yeah, I think that's really that's that's exactly that exactly nails it because if we think about um, actually doing what I presented and obfuscating the behavior of these systems, then they become less usable or less user-friendly or uh, from an ergonomics point of view, maybe it's not the optimal way to go. Um, so the way the differential privacy framework really works is that it's a trade-off. Um, so if we increase privacy, we lose performance. And here the performance would be quantified by usability of the systems. Uh, and then it becomes an optimization problem at that end. But uh, I think as we go forward, so we can maybe try to be a little bit more creative about it um, and, and think of other ways uh, where we can actually increase privacy, but maybe not lose that much uh, user friendliness or or uh, usability of these systems. But I think that really nails it um, as we try to 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 build systems that are essentially um, part of 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 our worlds. Yeah. Right. I'm thinking if if I'm going to do, let's say, uh, vehicle platoons uh, on the highway, mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell all my other mm -hmm. drivers. What kind of driver I am? No, because right. it's giving away exactly. a lot of privacy. Yeah. Of, yeah. You know, am I mm -hmm. an aggressive driver, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. do I have a lot yeah. of time? So, yeah. so, so exactly. I think it opens up a lot of interesting questions about uh, mm -hmm. what does that metric look like? Mm -hmm. Okay, more questions? Yeah, roughly. Um, for the for the privacy, the, you mentioned on, on how uh, a third party could be an observer of, of the scenario and infer um, mm -hmm. the state of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, what what modalities of sensing do, do you usually assume the observer might have? Is it mm -hmm. count the number of kind of communication yeah. or proximity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question too. Yeah, so the the observation is actually a design variable, um, and you can uh, if if I mean you're you're going to say what your system has to be robust or resilient to. Um, and it'll, it'll essentially be as a function of that. So in this particular case, it was uh, a counting problem. So how many, how many groups am I observing in that particular state? Um, and, uh, but I'd be happy to actually discuss a little bit more about this offline if you want to go into the details of some, some of the work we've done. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.